Hi, I'm Karen Elliott, and you're listening to the District B-Sides Podcast, where you'll hear in-depth conversations with council, staff, and community members to take you behind the decisions that are being made on topics that matter to Squamish. Now let's tune in and join the conversation. Uh, welcome, everyone, to a new episode of District B-Sides, uh, the District of Squamish's podcast to talk about some of the challenges and opportunities that our community is facing. Um, so I'm here today with uh, Jenna Stoner, one of our councillors, and also Ian Piggott, who's our manager of climate change and sustainability. And we've just wrapped up a mayor's drop-in conversation on climate change. And so we thought we would take a few minutes to share what we learned, um, some questions that are still on our minds uh, about um, acting on climate change. And um, happy to receive your feedback after you've listened to our podcast. So thanks very much. So um, it was a really interesting conversation. I, there wasn't a huge group of people there. We actually had a few um, district staff members there um, and three community members. But it was a far ranging conversation, which I really enjoyed and appreciated. Um, I think one of the big things that sort of kicked off this conversation was uh, the idea that climate change is, um, people are really feeling that sense of urgency. And I think you said this, Ian, it's now, it's not a problem of the future anymore. People can start to make the connections now to the fact that climate change is real. We can see it in um, um, wildfire. We can see it in major weather events. There's more science that is coming out now. Um, showing these connections to, to changes that are happening all around us right now. Um, but one of the things that, that I'm always concerned about in, in terms of the speed of reacting to and making changes around climate is that we don't leave people behind um, and this idea of, of equity. Um, so what did you hear in the conversation around the climate change file and, and equity? Uh, in our conversation that we just had? That's a, to me, it was certainly like a really prevalent point in our conversation. And I, I feel like it came up over and over, which is, uh, yeah, it's, it's really important to be, to be mindful of that. Um, you know, climate change is, a, it's fundamentally inequitable in, in so many ways down to the point, like, not just from an individual in a community, the more vulnerable people in a community are going to be more effective, but the more vulnerable communities are going to be more affected uh, as well globally. So, yeah, I think that uh, I was really happy to to hear that. Um, and just as us going forward, I, I think as a, as a municipality, we have to be really thoughtful uh, about that. And we can't just kind of ask people to spend our way out of this. Uh, electric vehicles are great. They're a huge part of the solution. Uh, energy, home energy retrofits are great. They're a huge part of the solution, but on their own, they're not sufficient. And we have to understand that a lot of people can't, can't do those things. So, yeah, so I think, you know, just equity has to be at the forefront of, of our thinking about this. Yeah, and Jenna, you know, you're, you're an elected, um, representative like myself, um, uh, one of our community members brought up the idea of, you know, Vancouver looking at mobility-based pricing and how that can seem like a really good idea. If you're traveling a long distance in a car, you should, you should pay for that. But pointed out that um, oftentimes it's workers who've been priced out of the Vancouver market. So the wealthy are living in Vancouver. People that have been priced out have to move further out and then commute to their jobs. And so is it actually a progressive policy or a regressive policy? And I think those are things that that we grapple with. What what's on your mind when you think about climate and and equity? I think uh, with all the actions that we are looking to take, both at the district, the municipal level, and then out where we advocate to higher levels of government. Um, for policy change, it's definitely something that we always have at the forefront of our mind is how equitable is that policy going to be? And I think that example of mobility pricing is a really good one where it has from a scientific and theoretical perspective, it makes a lot of sense as it can have sig significant impact from a climate perspective. But if you don't overlap that equity lens, um, 
you just end up uh, really harming, doing more harm than good in the long run. Um, and so I think it is, for me, it is a, it's a lens that I put on top of all of the discussions that we have around climate. They aren't one, uh, they aren't two separate pieces. They're one and the same. Um, and I think that has to go for everybody who is participating and, and actively engaged in this conversation that we can't separate those two. And if we do, then we, we won't be able to create uh, the future that we are actually looking to create, which is more equitable and, and climate friendly. We end up with a future uh, that is more divisive in the long term. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing that actually we didn't touch on in in marriage dropping, although we did talk about youth, was in in my mind the idea of um, generational equity. And um, one of the reasons that I got involved in politics is because I knew that one day my daughters would look up at me and say, "What did you do? Like you knew this was happening, <laughs> and did you do anything?" And and then back in 2014, I was like, I don't really have a good answer for that question when it comes. And, and so this idea of um, what is our responsibility as adults um, to take action now, uh, because we can't just pass on the damage to the next generation and, and make it their problem. That's already happened for far too long. If you look at, so when have, how long have we been talking about climate change scientifically? Yeah, it's decades. Yeah, well, we proved the greenhouse effect in 1860, which was right. a year before Darwin. So, <laughs> yeah, it's been a, we've known this for a while. Yeah, so that idea of generational equity, that is our responsibility. We need to act today and with a sense of urgency, um, the, the time is is now. And I, and I think the, the scientific reports um, and the consensus around that make it clear that really by 2030, we have to, to act. And so we have nine years left. And, and so I know that that fuels my fire and definitely the idea that we can't leave people behind. Um, we, as you say, and we can't buy our way out of this problem for, for everyone. So that, go ahead, Jenna. I was, yeah, that was, I think, a big part of the conversation too, in terms of uh, we know that there is this time crunch. 2030 is only nine years away, um, but that creates this tension around how fast, how quickly should we be taking these actions and also giving our community time to come along with us in those changes that need to happen? And that was a piece of the conversation from the mayor's drop-in that I pulled out and really appreciated some reflection on um, is, yeah, is exactly that. Like that we have nine years. That is not very much time. I feel like we should have been doing this 10 years ago already. Um, and so that's just a piece that I wanted to highlight from our conversation as well. Well, and it touches on how we communicate this, right? And so um, there was definitely a sense of that the district could be doing a better job creating the link, not just around climate, climate mitigation or climate adaptation, but how it leads us to a better community, a more healthy community, a more sustainable community, and, and really better painting that vision of it's not just climate mitigation for mitigation's sake or for climate's sake, but it actually could provide real benefits to the residents of the community. And so, I mean, and your team is at the forefront of sort of, you've launched our new webpage around climate action. Um, you know, how do you think about how we need to communicate with, with people in Squamish around climate? Here's on mute. Oh, I just said something so smart too, but I forgot it. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, yeah, we we definitely did have that in mind with the uh, with the website. Uh, you definitely something we can we can work more toward. Um, you'll notice in our climate action checklist, we have a we have a list of a list of icons that show the co benefits of all of these different actions. So that that was something we were working toward. One thing I'll throw in that just for interest sake is you can go to a level where you can like if you kind of tuck climate away too deeply, I think that is also problematic though. You don't want to just have better living and then by the way, you're dealing with climate change. I do think we need to overtly note and name 
the the challenge and that that motivation. So I think there needs to be a balance of um, climate change being part of this positive vision for a community, but also being clear that these are actions that we are taking um, to address this. If if it's just a side benefit, sometimes for other reasons it can get taken away. For right. um, so so yeah, so it's a it's a, a careful balance. I think you know we um related to this idea of communication is is actually the idea that um uh too much focus has been put on individual action versus systemic action and so you know certainly before I was elected um you know we we tried not to own a car we tried to you know change our our diet we I did win the zero waste challenge for council. <laughs> so thinking about, you know, what we buy and, and, and then how we dispose of it. Um, but, um, but where, where's the line for you, uh, Jenna, between individual action versus the systemic action, the really big policy changes that the government needs to make to, you know, by saying that we're single use items all have to be made from a compostable material or um, we are now going to change the BC building code to limit fossil fuel infrastructure in, in new buildings. Like those are big levers, senior levels of government, that, that big kind of systemic change that can happen versus getting people engaged by giving them agency and telling them what they can do to help. Where does, where does that land for you? To me, both matter and almost equally, but in different ways. So when we think about climate change and the greenhouse gas um, emissions reductions targets and, and look at it at a global level, I hate to say this, but your individual actions actually really don't matter. <laughs> They're a drop in the bucket in terms of if I was able to produce zero GHG emissions as an individual relative to our global GHG emissions, that's great, but it's actually not going to change the trajectory that we're on as a whole globe. Um, that's where that systemic change comes in and is so critical. But where the individual action really does matter is in order to socialize and normalize efforts towards that will enable that systemic change to happen. So um, building that community support in order to build more bike lanes and, and put more money towards transport or, share or uh, transit and active transportation. And so the individual action matters to a greater degree as well, because that is what normalizes that change in, in societal behavior and provides the community and political support to make that systemic change. And so it's easy to, to feel like as an individual, I don't make much of a difference in terms of reducing my GHG emissions, but if you reduce your GHG emissions and talk about it and email your local politicians about how important it is that we all start doing this, uh, then that's what enables a systemic change to happen as well. Your team must be thinking about this, Ian, and, and, the, and our website really does emphasize some of the individuals in our community that have taken action and, um, and played a role. Um, so where, where's the balance for you between those big policy moves that we're working on versus encouraging people to, to exercise their own, um, efforts? Yeah, I, I guess to me, they're, they're kind of two sides of the same coin. And I think the, the people, us in this conversation are in this kind of fortunate position when we get to play a role in both of those. But, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of people who don't you know, besides being active citizens, don't have as much say in policy and bylaws, uh, et cetera. So, um, you know, so allowing people to do what they can with the tools that they have is really important. Um, but so, uh, yeah, I definitely think both, you know, they're, they're inextricably linked, that the one drives the other and one pushes the other uh, toward action. And yeah, they, so we, we really need to, to tackle, tackle them both. It's really true. Um, and I, I appreciate this idea of um, uh, people's individual action creating political will. And I think people often underestimate 
um, how much courage it will take uh, elected officials to make the big policy changes that they need to make to address the climate emergency. And so the more people writing to their politicians, encouraging them to take bold action, locally, provincially, federally, is actually really important. We have polls that show the majority of citizens understand that climate change is real, that it needs to be addressed, that it is a major priority for Canadians. And yet still, some of that political courage is lacking. And so I don't want people to underestimate the very, very important role they have in encouraging that kind of courage in their political leaders and electing people that will act um, in, in the coming elections. So that is really important. And I think some, sometimes people think, does a letter really matter? And I read all the emails that we get on, on matters locally, and they do matter. They absolutely influence our thinking. And, and we may not always side with, with an individual letter, but it no doubt has, has changed our perspective on, on how we're thinking about an issue or the decision that we're making or why we're, we're making the decision. So I do encourage people never to forget that that, that is actually a really big power that each individual holds. Um, so here's the thing, Ian, we have these six big moves. It's a massive plan. We've already admitted that it actually doesn't get us all the way there. We're gonna have to keep seeking out opportunities. So how do you, how are you prioritizing with council? Like, what do we do first and what needs to wait? Because we can't do the whole plan at once. And yet we've got nine years. So um, how, how has that been um, prioritized within your team and, and what we're actioning first out of our community climate action plan? Sure, that's a great question. And just if that wasn't enough, also it doesn't even include all of the emissions. <laughs> Body emissions aren't in there, so uh, just add that little spice to the to the cocktail. So, for us, we're really trying to be relentlessly pragmatic and also very opportunistic in our approach. Uh, we're in a, a pretty interesting point in time when the other levels of government are trying to add uh, stimulus to the economy in a various ways. So, really being uh, up on that and really trying to take advantage of these other uh, other opportunities that, that we can leverage to kind of punch above our numbers. That's something we're, um, we're really working toward. Uh, one thing that has been very valuable is we've, we've trying to collaborate more and more with other local governments. And there's, there's this tremendous spirit of, of sharing and teamwork with this amongst this topic. So, um, you know, Whistler is a great example. We are talking with Whistler. I, I talk with my counterpart in Whistler several times a week, and we're, we're collaborating on, on many projects. Very often, the provincial and federal government look very favorably when you're part of a collaboration in a project. So, you know, if, if we can work together and um, do the same things and learn from each other, and sometimes, I'll be honest, just copy from each other, uh, that's a way that we can really, really move ahead. So that's a few, just a few of the things. Jenna, what's your, your sense as you look at what we've prioritized in our budgets and um, around the Community Climate Action Plan? I like the words that Ian used, pragmatic and opportunistic, and balancing those two. Uh, I think in terms of the actions that we've prioritized in, in this year's budget, at least, really balances those two. So the things that we know are our quick big wins in terms of reduction emissions, like the landfill gas capture and flaring. Um, and then also identifying where there is opportunity for a higher level or grants from higher levels of government. Um, and I'd say we also take that approach when we think about uh, our role for advoca advocacy to both the provincial and federal government as well. Um, looking at that as both a where is their opportunity? We know that there's work going on. And so let's help push them in, in that direction. And then also, where are we seeing the really big blocks where we need their help so that we have more leverage to move some of these forwards, these things forward? And where do we push that? So that more pragmatic sense, um, I think, are two good pieces that we pull both from uh, implementing actions as well as advocacy. Yeah. I you know, to me, the overwhelming sense of the need for um, 
deep collaboration, not reinventing the wheel. As you say, Ian, like if someone's already figured something out, we're just going to copy it. Like we don't need to be the freighter of all good ideas. And so I think that that spirit amongst local governments of, yeah, we want to go fast. And who's who's ahead on this? Like who can we follow on this particular poly, policy piece? Because there will be areas where we're leading. Um, and I think our low carbon incentive that that went to public hearing is one of those places. I think our smart growth um, density discussion that we have going on in our neighborhood planning are are leading in a lot of respects. So, so we're happy to share there. But what can we learn from from the progress other communities are making? Um, and and Jen and I now sit together on the regional district board, and we've approved a full time climate uh, person for the region. Uh, which I think that now gives um, yourself and and Whistler sustainability manager and climate change someone to work with on that regional level, like all the way up past Lillooet to um, down to uh, Burry Creek. So that's um, that's amazing to me that we can start to take a regional lens to addressing this. Um, and, and I don't want to miss also sort of some of the things we're doing at the district behind the scenes that don't necessarily capture headlines. So our uh, strategic uh, procurement policy that we changed. So now awarding contracts based on um, GHG emissions, uh, whether people are paying a living wage, whether they can help um, support reconciliation, all those things can start to be considered in, into how we uh, contract the work we need to do at the district, which is exciting. And we're part of the Coastal Communities Social Procurement Initiative. Um, and that's a big collaboration with a whole bunch of local governments on the island and Sunshine Coast. Um, so I'm super excited to be part of that. Um, and then also we have a whole internal team that's looking at our buildings and, and how we can reduce our footprint. Uh, as a district. So right now we have to buy offsets to be carbon neutral, but one of our goals is to reduce the amount we need to offset by just having more efficient buildings and doing things differently. So, you know, I love that that work is going on and, and maybe doesn't make the headlines, but is absolutely critical. Um, and one of and that work, oh, sorry. Head in, yeah. Oh, I was, I was just going to add that, that that work is a real stitch in time because uh, it's so much easier to build an efficient building than to retrofit an existing building. So we have this like once in a ge 10 generation opportunity with the number of new corporate buildings that we can build them well now and save ourselves a lot of emissions and a lot of money over the long term. So it's a, it's a really exciting point in time for that. Uh, Cal Bragg and Kareem Ledoux are both working really hard on that and others. Maybe you could say a bit about the fire hall and, and our ability to sort of set an example as well for the, the building community. Sure. Uh, I guess one cool example that comes to mind is the deconstruction of the fire hall. So we were able to um, quite quite kind of late in the, in the game uh, ask for uh, diver uh, a pretty aggressive diversion of the materials from the fire hall demolition. And I believe we we ended up with over 90% diversion from the fire hall. So nine out of 10 kilograms of material did not end up in our in our landfill. So so it's an interesting opportunity for us to show that this is not, you know, doing this is not economic Armageddon. Suicide. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that it can happen and it, it can happen relatively easily. And that this is something that should happen to every deconstruction that's that's going on and it's super important because closing the loop on waste is one of the six big moves and you might remember the number off the top of your head ian in terms of what percentage of our ghg emissions come from waste specifically about 20. yeah so that's <laughs> that's a big piece that we can make some substantial moves on with examples like that totally all right so there's a really interesting conversation coming up um with our economic leadership team this week around uh, the donut economy and Kate Raworth's work on that. Um, and so one of the questions that came up in the mayor's drop-in was like growth for growth's sake. And, you know, is it time to start changing our thinking on that? And I am fascinated by this idea of um, 
what does success look like for our community in addressing climate and 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 also making sure that the city is livable um so i don't know if you guys have had a, much exposure to the the work of the um on the donut economy but i'd be interested to hear your thoughts on on what you heard in the conversation today around how fast we should be growing or what we should be focused on in terms of our success as a community. The donut economy is really interesting. I haven't delved into it in, in a whole bunch of detail, but I think the shift away from measuring uh, success or measuring um, uh, simply just off GDP is is so important because we know that there are ecological limits, that if we continue just to use those basic measures of growth, they aren't going to give us uh, the indicators that we need in order to actually measure, are we happy? Are we healthy? What does our community really want to look and feel like in 15 years rather than just, hey, our GDP has grown by X percent. Um, and so I'm really excited to hear that this conversation is going to be happening amongst our community and with our business community to get their sense of, of how do we start to shift? What other indicators do we need to start to think about? And I think in our conversation in the drop in, mayor's drop-in, um, it came up from, uh, from an economic development perspective. And we often talk about growth of target sector firms and, and bringing more jobs here to Squamish. Um, it is part of our strategic plan to increase the number of, uh, of uh, target sector employers uh, year over year. Um, but there is a piece there in our framing of the strategic plan that I do think is missing, which is it isn't growth just for growth sake, it's growth so that in five years time, we have fewer people that are commuting on the highway and they can actually work here and, uh, and live here and play here. Um, and that they can actually get what it is they need down the street and they have that livable, walkable community. Um, and so I think that that conversation around the donut economy will help us start to think about going beyond the indicators that we've typically used and what else do we need to be measuring in order to measure the success of our community in the long term. Mm -hmm. it's, I think it's so important to start um, aligning more with the UN sustainability goals. And I think the donut economy a concept gets us closer to that, but there's multiple factors, as you say, um, that lead to the success of a community than just economic growth. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I love the quote from Elizabeth May that said, you know, there's there's nothing that a dead economy can, a dead planet can offer to the economy, but lots of free parking. And it just really, <laughs> really speaks to the idea that like, us just thinking about the economy as an end to itself is is so limited. <laughs> that, so thinking about the economy more broadly and the benefits are to people is a is a much better way to go about this. And I, I feel like our economic development team really embraces that. Yeah, that's a great point. All right, just to wrap up, um, I would love to know if you've read a book or listened to a podcast around climate change or something that you're reading now or listening to now that uh, you would recommend to uh, the folks that are listening to this podcast. Jenna. Oh, I have a great podcast suggestion. It's a Gimlet podcast called How to Save a Planet. Uh, it is fantastic. It dives into all kinds of uh, different topics on uh, very solutions oriented. How is it that we are going to save our planet from climate change? And here are the actions that we need to take. Uh, so that is a fantastic one. Uh, on my nightstand, I do have Naomi Klein's This Changes Everything that I am trying to power through. I'm about two thirds of the way and I'm not sure I'm going to make it. Uh, but it is also a very good and eye opening book. Uh, it is just very, very dense. Right. Thank you. Uh, in website, podcast, book, what would you recommend? Sure. This this is about a 60-year late uh, recommendation, but I actually just finally finished the book Dune, which um, which I just loved in the in the pandemic. Reading science fiction is just this great way to escape, um, which we can't in many other ways right now. And it's it's just such an interesting ecological understory to it. The way they're trying to 
to make this planet habitable. So I, I just really, really enjoyed that and got a got a lot out of it. So great recommendation. Um I am on a panel in May with Seth Klein and so thought I should actually read his new book. So I am reading A Good War, uh, Mobilizing Canada for the Climate Emergency. And uh, I've just started it um, and really intrigued by this idea of, um, you know, if we can mobilize our economy and our people to support uh, the cause around the Second World War, how would we do it? Uh, for climate change and and what's my role in that. So very interested um, both to read the book and also to hear what Seth has to say at the conference in May. So, And last but not least, we can't forget a shameless plug for squamish.ca forward slash climate action. Yes. It has all of the details about uh, our community climate action plan, uh, local steps that you can take, uh, and uh, some deep dives on how climate adaptation and mitigation is being addressed uh, by the district. Thanks, Jenna. That's a good plug. Uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in today. If you've got any feedback on this podcast or any of the others, uh, send an email or send a note to communications at squamish.ca. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll catch you next time on District B-Sides. Mm -hmm.